Welcome to the Media Roundtable. We're talking to leading voices in podcast about what they create, why they create it, and the impact they want to have on the world. So whether you're a member of the marketing community or a podcast listener who just cares about the direction of this country and the messages that you advance, we want to help you feel good about what you consume, what you distribute, and what you support. I'm your host, Dan Granger, and today we're joined by Virginia Heffernan. Virginia is a fascinating person. She is a journalist, critic, author, uh, and most recently the author of the book Magic and Loss, The Internet as Art, which I hope we'll get a chance to talk about. She is the host of the uh, podcast This is Critical through Stitcher. She was the co-host of Slate's Trump cast, very successful program. Uh, She's also a contributing editor at Wired and a frequent contributor to the LA Times, the Atlantic, the New York Times, and so much more than that. Welcome to the show, Virginia. Appreciate you coming. Thank you so much for having me, Dan. I'm excited to chat. And uh, were we accurate in that bio? How much misinformation did I have? Sometimes it sneaks in there. Totally right. It's a it's like it's a freelance patchwork checkered um, past, but there have been a lot of um, so far. Um, a lot of exciting experiences, including podcasting. Yeah, well, and um, and you've been, you've had a chance to dabble in a few different um, formats uh, mm-hmm. for now. Let's um, before we get into the podcast, because I, I think that's uh, going to be one of the the primary topics that we have a chance to talk about today. Can we go back a few years and just talk about your book? Because I know that oh, sure. um, that was significant, and um, uh, and I don't. Um, I don't even want to try to introduce the topic. Would you mind just giving um, the audience a little bit of a summary of what Magic and Lost was really about and your your main um, premise? Yeah, so I'm 52 in the 70s. A very strange thing happened in my hometown of Hanover, New Hampshire, which is that we got the internet um, in the 1970s, which was unheard of. It wasn't uh, called the internet. It was in the era of ARPANET. And we just called it the computer. And as a kid, I started, quote, playing the computer, um, playing this adventure game, like sort of D&D, that tilted into chat, right? And like so many things do, it basically became a social network. Um, And, uh, you know, I followed um, computing and network computing as it became AOL and CompuServe. But I always retained the idea that it was a cultural project project and not a tech project or a business project. And I always had in my head that when you get on, get on the computer or online, you are playing the computer, that there's some play in it. And I noticed as I, um, I did a PhD in English, but all the while maintained this interest in network computing and sort of embryonic VR in the like burgeoning metaverse. I just noticed that it was like mostly being treated as a business project or a tech project or a science project, a military project, um, commercial project. And I didn't see the internet that was the kind of sensory emotional experience of the internet that was there at the beginning and is still there as it's become a place where we live. So I wanted to treat the internet as a as a civilization, as a, as a set of cultural artifacts belonging to a new civilization. Um, and I would liken the internet that I discovered in 1979 to maybe blockchain now. Um, it just, you know, most people are laughing at it and worried about it. And a small group of people are completely fascinated by it and want to be part of it. Um, and, um, and so I, I really wanted to convey that. So I, the internet is art or the internet in some places in the book, I say it's a, it's kind of, it's a masterpiece of civilization. I don't mean it's at all perfect or that all the art on it is good art because most of it is not, but that these are cult memes are cultural affairs, you know, not, not primarily the product of venture capital or business thinking or even uh, engineering. Um, But they're this kind of comprehensive process of making meaning of the world. Um, And and that's what led me to write Magic and Loss. And sorry, one last thing is the magic is, um, you know, the kind of 
technology so good you can barely tell it from magic like just still we have hardly any ideas ordinary consumers how the internet works the loss is you know how people talk about lossy compression you know lossy audio files um mm -hmm. the the loss is that mysterious but persistent nagging idea that something is missing now that we're we're so consistently online well so can you can you go into that piece a little bit more deeply um is that is that loss real and what is the the answer to that feeling of loss yeah that's a good question about it being real i mean in i think that the i think the uh, original idea of an mp3 representation of sound signals so everyone knows this from early itunes or from whatever you were using uh limewire in my case or napster um that those files are not seen as recordings of music but as representations of sound signals and without going into too much detail they capture if you imagine sound like a topographical map where some sounds some signals are like deep and thick and some of them are thinner and valleys it just slices off that sort of top part without capturing um capturing the 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 depth underneath it and that doesn't mean anyone can really tell the difference um it just means uh more like if you took a picture from a of a topographical topographical map so that would be 2d but you had a 3d thing underneath it and there is some sense real or imagined and it might be out out of the bounds of of uh ordinary ears but there's some sense that there's something there we're missing. Now that's one where it could be all in our heads. It, you know, when you hear vinyl listeners describe what they love about vinyl records, it's always really kind of hard to understand. I mean, there's a muddy base that people associate with warmth, but mm. it's hard or the little staticky, hairy sound of the needle that sometimes has dust on it, but it's really hard to get what they're describing. And yet that, feeling is so um conjures such a sense of well-being for some people so they feel they've lost that all right that's a specific example but then i mean it's a specific but impressionistic example then there's the fact that you know what have we lost well you know looking at a tree is an extremely robust kind of there's the vivacity of a tree compared to looking at an iPhone screen with that's this big that doesn't allow for peripheral vision or depth vision and that has like little suburban McMansions, i.e. apps on it that are, seem almost designed to stultify the senses. Um, and, uh, and so what's lost is sensory experience. What's lost is, you know, shared auditory experience in lots of cases, just sort of being present in the world and literally what's lost is you know people talk about all kinds of occult brain damage done by the internet but you don't have to look farther than the senses you know uh teenagers can some you know substantial percentages of teenagers from using headphones can't tell p's and t's apart and um my eyes i don't know about you but have just gotten progressively worse and that the way i can tell is i keep making the font size so the mm. point size on my phone bigger and bigger and you know the thing where like kids laugh at how bright older people have their phones you know yeah. we yeah. all know why that is because the more you watch it the more you need you know it to fill out so um i've written a lot lately about the sensory costs of living living on the internet but isn't it even a broader point than that um just when you think about things like relationships and the ways that we communicate with each other and connect um, and the way we we find meaning is it is that all is the MP3 metaphor um, also analogous to you know the substitution of like physical presence and being able to experience the majesty of of things of of relationships of any experience and substituting yeah. it with something that's pixel driven. Yeah, I mean, I have. Um... I try because again, my background's in the humanities. I try mm -hmm. to stick to artifacts. Um, I try not to extrapolate too much from the immediate sensory emotional experience because, you know, people are forever conjuring ideas of what different technologies have done to us. Mm -hmm. You know, there were certain kinds of 
ideas of um, train spine or something, or like a certain trauma inflicted on the body just by trains. Or we're in a terrible time because, you know, the collagist said like, because a newspaper might fall on another newspaper and then you would see things that don't make sense. So or, it's like standing uh, next to their microwave while it's going and, you know, and all of the old yes. wives tales that, that come from that. Yeah. We're that always afraid of new technology. We're afraid of new technology and we don't, it, it's, it just, it's both too big and too small to say that it might be compromising our relationships because you and I are not in the same room with each other. We yeah. don't really know, like maybe we would have, and this is why it's significant, I think, or it colored my impression of the internet that I came on so young is that I loved the freedom to be, you know, forget about just non-binary. Like I could be any age, I could be any gender. I loved the masquerade. I loved all the stuff that people think is dangerous for kids because showing up with name, rank, and serial number in real life at the time meant that no one would take me seriously. Mm. And I wanted, as one does, to talk as time went on about Reaganomics, right? But who wants to listen to a 12-year-old girl talk about Reaganomics? Well, it turns out lots of people who listen to me as, quote, as like capital A, Athena, which was my first screen name, um, would listen to me with more authority. So the, my imagination just went wild on the internet. And then there's the other thing of like, you know, this wonderfully interesting thing that the old editor of Modern Love at the New York Times said, which is that in the early days of that column, the submissions came from people who had physical experiences without emotional connections. And now the reverse is true. Emotional experiences via Zoom, text, twit, Tinder, chat, whatever, without sexual and physical experiences. So both of those seem to be impoverished relationships, but it's not totally clear that the second one is worse in some way or represents we're going to hell in a handbasket, um, you know, than the first. And um, yeah, so leading a very, very symbolic existence, it people like to slag it off and say, oh, things were so much better in these other times, but you know, a lot of our experience all along from simply reading to listening to recorded music has been in the world of symbols. Um, and so for people like me and probably like you, um, you know, it's not, it's not a, it's, it doesn't take the metaverse mm -hmm. to introduce, you know, stories. I'm like reaching for a book, but like, you know, a story that coexists with reality. Um, that's not a huge leap for us. So I do try to soften the idea that everything has changed and moreover changed for the worse. So, and I, I was trying to think about the timing of when that book came out. It was like 2017, right? 2016. 2016. Yeah. Oh, 16. Interesting. Okay. Yeah. Significant year. <laughs> yeah. Significant year. And so I just wonder if it was this kind of a, it was a very, um, maybe the beginning of people kind of turning on the internet and going, okay, this is very dangerous. Look, there are real world consequences for this. Were you, was there any part of you writing this that was uh, reacting to that and saying, I'm actually going to take the view that this is not a bad thing and really try to, you know, make people see that it's like anything it's, it's in how you use it. Or am I uh, vastly over interpreting? No, no, no. I think that's, that is, that is, um, that's absolutely right. I mean, I, I thought, well, okay. So the, the um, invitation in the book was to see the internet as um, something to read instead of something to live, right? Mm. So I just, because I also having played it as a game as a kid in a time when the internet went off overnight, like just like TV used to. So it seemed like this contained experience. And I worried that people with less experience dealing with symbols, either less experience, less time spent reading or less time spent, um, yeah, consuming symbols or living in a living in symbolic orders would not have that capacity. Um, and you may remember this if you were an English major or if you took classes. Um, that the you know the sort of psychic attitude toward fiction 
is something that the uh, poet Coleridge called the willing suspension of disbelief. Yeah, you've probably heard this phrase. Yeah, and that it's 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 not it's on the one hand sounds not easy. Like what might that be? Is, you know, we're usually it seems approaching experience as either reality or a kind of a lie. Um, but then there's this other operation that we do all the time without really thinking about it. Another, I don't know, I don't know how the brain works exactly, but another kind of facet of ex or experience is to read a book or watch a Netflix show that's extremely immersive, that might have, you know, all kinds of things going on, like squeamish making things or um, dangerous things, but that every, we're capable as in a distinctly human way of the mechanism of literacy that allows us to both enjoy the fiction without kicking too hard at the tires of it to find out if it's true. And then with going back into our lives and not imagining that the figures in it are actual people who we should, you know, go and try to liberate from Comet Pizza. And, you know, that's like a reference to the QAnon and, and Pizzagate fictions. That, so I, I did, I think, overestimate the capability of, of most internet users hmm. to be able to dis, to be able to enter into this fictional state where, you know, we're using avatars, we're using thumbnail pictures of ourselves. We don't look in real life like our pictures do on the screen, even in Zoom, where we're like in pretty realistic settings. But, you know, we know that our eyes can tell that difference right that like your complexion or whatever would be different if i saw you more various more interesting like some of this is flattened um and let alone the highly photoshopped picture that i use in my book um and uh and well i'll tell you one funny story when some uh, some i spoke to my kid my child's first grade class about the book when it when it first came out she was in first grade and um the only question the guy had what uh, one of the kids had was why don't you look like your picture uh, right. Well, okay. it, what yes. one of the kindergartners said this? One of the yeah, first graders. First graders, and, sorry. Yeah. Right. So I said, exactly. That <laughs> is what this book is about. <laughs> that is what this book is about. Because this correct. picture is right. Correct. Nailed. Done. I I you've written it. Because you know, kids know they use other names online. They take pictures that are at least flattering, if not filtered and doctored. True. And that extends to how you write online. You know, I'm really regularly on Twitter. And on Twitter, my avatar is much more daring than I am in real life and um, much more willing to engage in a uh, frank and friendly exchange of views, if not, you know, subtweeting and mild trolling and, you know, all that kind of stuff and uh, things I would never do with my family and friends. But it's a it's a kind of massively multiplayer online role playing game that some of us really enjoy, and and honestly, I would say most of us really enjoy. I mean, the the so basically trolls, you're saying we're all larping all the time, and we just don't even realize all, it. Well, and we do realize it. I think that's the point. Is okay. that like even a kid knows, you know? Oh, right, you look like this in your picture. I still recognize it as you you know, quotation marks, you, but we're also um, in, involved in these interesting masquerades and suspensions of disbelief of fiction. And then we can also read white papers, read graphs, you know, read, uh, read statistics um, and, um, and even papers in science and turn on a different part of our minds and not stop suspending the disbelief, and commit to the skepticism. But in these operations, it's incredible how many of us pull them off. It just has been particularly visible how many people have been unwilling or unable to do that hmm. um, in, in, since, since, uh, since I'd say the like disinformation attacks, the quote fake, what was originally called fake news of that summer when I was touring. Um, and I'll say one more thing about this. Do you, do you mind? Please. Oh, okay. The, the MIT did a study, I can't get my mind off in 2017, that said that people, all things being equal, are more likely to share, uh, share fictional memes than 
than nonfiction, than factual ones, even if the factual ones confirm their bias. It's very weird. We have a perverse attraction to the elegance, the rhyme and reason of fiction. So for instance, there was a story circulating that Donald Trump had once uh, put a kid on his private plane when he was a businessman, put a kid on his private plane to fly him to the hospital, sick kid, and allowed him to go. Nobody spread it. No Trumpite spread it. Why? Because it was true. <laughs> Amazing, right? Amazing. Because it, there's something boring about the story, right? It doesn't have, I, I, I love if anyone just listened to the audio, Dan just did a mind blown thing. I feel the same way. I don't really true. have a response. Yeah. <laughs> Not sure how to, how to feel. Um, and so what, and, and, and also the other reason that people share things is if they're disgusting, if they're, mm. they arouse uh, disgust, fury, um, sexual arousal. So Porn and snuff, and one thing that and cable news porn and snuff also. especially, porn and snuff is a, is a big hallmark of a lot of cable news, including yeah. including um, including Fox. Like it's it's incredible how often they talk about um, death and sex. Um, but anyway, so people share those things, and um, one thing that Rick Wilson, one of the Project Lincoln guys, told me is that red state or older people, older people, let's say, of all stripes, didn't get um, kind of inoculated against pornography. They didn't like, you know, internet, they were just like, they, they just didn't have any immunity set up mm -hmm. to it. Like, they hadn't watched Deep Throat, they hadn't been part of the counterculture, they hadn't like seen uh, internet porn when they first got on the internet. Um, and so when Fox News came on, and people were, you know, with Roger Ailes, like, you know, women with their legs doing this and that. And then all this crazy disinformation with cannibalism and all these other things, just too much hyper arousal in, in, in brains not accustomed to it. Um, I've stopped even quoting artifacts of disinformation from QAnon because I don't want to venture into the mess of those stories mm. because we'll all get too excited about them, you know, like either to be disgusted, to be disgusted one way or the other, to be disgusted because right, because right wingers, far right people might believe something like, you know, that, that Tom Hanks drinks the blood of children. Or if you're on the right, you might fear that Tom Hanks does indeed drink the blood of children. And now here we are with the blood of children, dead children all in our minds. And that's when you start to trade the information. So cooling off your emotional and nervous system and activating the brain where literacy lives is what I asked of readers in that book. And I think every, most people already had it, you know, but some people didn't. Hmm. So um, a lot has happened since you wrote that book, as you may have heard. And uh, I wonder if you could just um, take us, let's hop into the, the present. What has happened in between um, from your lens? Has your perspective shifted at all? Um, and uh, is, is the message of that the same? And is that, is that impacting the work that you're doing today? Yes, absolutely. Let me just so, ask you four really open-ended questions and see what happens. <laughs> so I, I, I guest hosted um, a show that Slate had started, the podcast that Slate had started in 2016 um when trump was a mere candidate for the republican nomination um and then uh all when he won i um just soon after jacob asked me jacob weisberg who started the show and then started pushkin yeah. um so another yeah of interest to podcasters um he started he had started trumpcast it was his first foray into podcasting and he was hosting he asked me to join and um, it was, I was able finally to sort of, my circuits were blown, you know, by the election of Trump, like so many of us, it just changed so much about what we thought I, or at least I'll just speak for myself, my own trajectory, the trajectory of the country, the trajectory in uh, weird ways of the internet and of culture. Um, and so I was really happy to like, feel like I was part of some effort to clarify at least what was happening, um, you know, in the country. 
Um, and that podcast became a godsend. I know that it was see, seemed and 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 was sometimes stressful, but you know, for four years I was part of it, and then I took it over for the last I don't know year and a half or two years, um, and um, it was just really fascinating to talk to people from different different angles about it. You know, everyone from Rebecca Solnit to General James Clapper, um, you know, Adam Schiff, basically, you know, every single pundit that you can think of mm -hmm. or federal prosecutor and just get this late life education because there's nothing better than getting a topic that's like Moby Dick where you can tell any story basically because Trump had just like it had just punched a hole in reality or whatever to have him as president. And so everyone had responses and they were really interesting responses from all quarters. You know, suddenly people with expertise in in uh, cult, cult, you know, cult, cultishness, cult mind control um, had something to say or people who knew about uh, money laundering had something to say. So it was a great way to touch all aspects of the culture, meet a lot of new minds and voices and um, and grapple in a meaningful way. And, you know, at times a kind of nihilistically hilarious way <laughs> with what was happening. Um, and, uh, but then I was very happy to see that show go too. Mm. Yeah. And so where are we today? I mean, we're, we're in a post Trump world, maybe, uh, mm. maybe, uh, we're in a, are, 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 what stage of the pandemic are we even in right now? I'm really interested <laughs> to have you kind of summarize from your perspective, like, what is the state of our culture in America? Like, what is this? Mm -hmm. It's a very peculiar well, time to try to define, I think. Yeah. Yeah. I think that's right. I mean, the reason I switched from covering politics, I was also writing an op-ed column for the LA times for those four years. The reason I made a promise to myself that I would stop covering politics head on because it seemed like, I don't know, maybe this is very impressionistic. So Dan, Downstream I don't know, from culture. Yes, exactly. Yeah. Yep. Politics seemed muddy. That's exactly the phrase. And we don't even want to attribute it because it comes from a nefarious source. <laughs> it comes from Breitbart. But, um, but yes, exactly. It seemed like politics was this very muddy, um, refracted version of kind of cultural conversations yeah. that were extremely interesting, right? So like, I'll just take one, which is on the show this week. And, and I think this will open up to maybe some responses to your question. Um, this week, we're talking about the red pilling of yoga. Um, and, you know, you probably know some of this, but uh, there were people, including the Q shaman at January 6th, uh, on January 6th, who were part of the insurrection, you know, the guy with the pelts and the, oh, yeah, 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 you yeah. know, antler, antlers. Or, um, he came from a world of organic food and Ayurveda and like, you know, rejecting the he was uh, anthrax. A shaman. He was a freaking shaman, right? He was like exploring, appropriating, you know, indigenous cultures and, and in some cases, uh, some Asian religions. Um, and somehow he was the kind of person that you would think was like your loony new age, you know, cousin's friend or whatever. And then he tilted into being this right winger who, when he, he flew under the banner of Q and whatever. So how did this happen? Well, if I were on Trump cast, I might, I would just have, I would have to talk about the prosecutions to do with January 6th. Mm -hmm. I'd have to talk about, you know, all of these insurrectionists as if they were a monolith. But what became that's all fruit great, though, and you wanted to go to roots. Yes. Yeah. I wanted to go to roots, and I wanted to find out. That's it. That's. The, I mean, you know, I could I could probably spell it out from there, but you just nailed it. I wanted to find out how in the world yoga ended up getting these, you know, connections to the right, and there there's really wonderful work in this field, but it's a it takes a light touch because. It's very complicated. You know, we all have friends of friends who, you know, started to get very worried about GMOs and then worried about the deep state and yeah. then worried about, you know what I mean? And how does that happen? Um, and it can go into really interesting angles. 
So as far as direction of the culture, I really like stepping back because it gives me, in a very simple way, I like thinking that other humans with other imaginations, other languages, other skills have been through plagues before, they've been through tyrants before, they've been through uh, you know, the presence of virulent racism before, um, and, um, and not that they came out great and it all got better, but more like they came up with solutions. And if we keep our minds free, we can come up with approaches, solutions, adaptations, imaginative responses also. So, you know, it, it plays into Trump's hands, a minoritarian president in the extreme. It plays into the hands of the right to say, oh, we've been in four years of the right four years or and counting of like in grips to uh, in the grips of these you know kind of proto fascists really we also saw the greatest uprising you know kind of civil rights and more uprising with black lives matter that ever ever seen in my life ever seen in my lifetime world's historically global movement so and then we also saw the women's march the largest one day uh, protest in the history of the world and these were on, you know, they were safeguarding women's reproductive rights, asking for police reform across, you know, across the spectrum of the of progressive politics. And instead, we just say, well, you know, it's it's like the whole the world belongs to Jordan Peterson. Well, it does not. And they're they're like more than that signs of life. And the other thing is where we sit around groaning about Trump when Biden decisively won the election and both houses of congress democrats won so in some ways you know it's kind of like the lambs are still crying clarice like mm. we still are like oh my god donald trump just got elected you know it's just all starting again do you believe it um when in some ways a huge portion of this catastrophe i think is behind us and i know that that seems like a risky thing to say for people and if 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 to keep your vigilance up or to keep you spurred to political and inventive action, you need to believe that there's like an apocalypse around the corner. That seems okay. But for me, I can think much more clearly if I get, you know, keep my apprehension of the culture kind of right sized, as they say, you know? Mm -hmm. Well, so what, what is the, the problem today as you see it, if there is one? Um, well, I'm very like recently moved by this book, The Dawn of Everything, that's um, by David Graeber and David Wengro. Um, they talk a lot about stuckness because, and they put a big premium on, this is a book of anthropology and archeology span that is very original in many, many ways, but I'll just focus on one thing. Their worry is that we don't like dare to dream much anymore, hmm. you know, like, well, instead of talking about um, whole new ways of organizing us or more ecstatic modes of being or, or like a more robust egalitarianism or more female autonomy, instead of just like, oh, maybe I could get an abortion at this, maybe at this clinic if I pray to Brett Kavanaugh, right? That, but we don't think big enough. We don't, so I guess I would say my, when you say what's the problem, the problem is the defensive crouch that we're in because many of us are feeling afraid and traumatized. And so it is really hard to be, you know, I love that so many young people are embracing a non-binary identity, not as a political issue, but just because you need to make some more freedom and space in your brain and your self conception in order to, uh, you know, take on, um, you know, take on the problems of the world and also try to find, you know, moments of luminous tranquility in it. Um, and I see, um, I do see young people doing that, you know, and I feel, I do feel inspired by that. So the problem I think is that stuckness and the solution is, that kind of grander idea of freedom and imagination. 
So this this is all right in the the wheelhouse of what we've been trying to do on this show. And you know, one of the we we kind of took the idea of um, culture is downstream from politics. So what is culture downstream from, and how can we in media mm -hmm. and in the advertising mm -hmm. community be more mindful of how we point dollars and attention to oh, reward yeah. things that are that are helpful on that root level. Um, and so it's interesting when you talk about, you know, getting into the crouching position and everybody being on defense. I, I mean, I, that speaks mm -hmm. um, very closely um, to what, what I see is happening, because I feel like you take any opportunity for us to innovate, for us to collaborate, for us to work together on things that we actually could have consensus on, and we'll find a way to fight about it. It's yes. like, Here's a yeah. problem. Throw a problem in the middle of the room and watch everybody blame, you know, go to two opposite sides and blame each other for starting it yeah. and do yeah. nothing to actually make it better. Right. And, and, and yeah, I, yeah, yeah. I feel like that's what's affecting us. So like, you know, I, like this is probably too big to even talk about. And, and I am no I am ill qualified to do it. But just as like a consumer of media, you know, I, I have concerns about you know, what's happening in China, how dependent are we, and what does that mm. mean for the future of what we're trying to do? And what's funny mm. is, or I don't know if it's funny, it's sad, but I see agreement on both sides of the aisle on this topic, but nobody's mm -hmm. actually looking at it as an opportunity to go, hey, can we ha have some common uh, themes that we can align around and go, okay, how do we want to attack, you know, approach this issue together? No, mm -hmm. we can't even get started. You can't even get started. You've got enough bipartisan yes. agreement on climate to do something you can't but you can't really get started because it's another opportunity to fight and you know i think in the last couple of years you know i think uh, social dilemma brought a lot of awareness made a lot of awareness yeah. mainstream to what was happening and just the you know the the kind of outrage industrial complex and how mm -hmm. we're all being gamed a little bit um yeah. but you know i know i don't know that anybody's come up with anything to do about it now do you see so I, I feel very aligned with you on the 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 bad fruit that we're experiencing and the in the mm -hmm. it, it may not be as much of a problem as an opportunity cost right yeah yeah and so but do you see it as do you see it as a as a as one political side of the spectrum as a victim of the other side or do you feel that mm. um uh to to some extent everybody's been played we played ourselves. We didn't even realize we were doing it, but here mm. we are. Um, or do you feel like, no, 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 there is, there's kind of a, a good, a good group and a bad group. Um, yeah, I, de I definitely don't feel like there's a good group and a bad group. Um, but that doesn't, isn't always reflected. I mean, I have exactly the same capacity for spiked cortisol as the next person. And, you know, I, I, in upstate uh, in upstate New York a lot of the time and there are plenty of Trumpites and just reacting to you know I've I've spent time looking at you know the blue lives matter flag right yeah. it's, so the American flag with a little blue line in it and I didn't get it at first and then someone explained it to me and it crystallized into something that I could start to it could start to like make my heart pound faster with a combination of fear and images of George Floyd and then also just hatred and kind of fuck the police feelings and it was just this cultural artifact right mm -hmm. and I was thinking I've got to be able to look through the lands look along the landscape without everything spiking you know my nervous system so much that I can't I'm frozen with antipathy with intent with even violent feelings, you know, it just, I can't go through every day like this because I'll pass another flag like that or I'll see fuck Joe Brandon, Joe Brandon, fuck Joe, whatever that is. Yeah, thing. yeah, yeah. Brandon, <laughs> let's go Brandon. We know where you're um, going. Um, and uh, I will, and then I'll get mad all over again, right? Or I'll see, mm. um, yeah, comments about the Super Bowl halftime performance. And um, I don't know if you remember this book, you know, Temple Grandin. She's like a, um, an autistic. Uh, it's on academic. my HBO watch list. I'm going to watch okay. it. I'm not going to read it, but it's a oh, good it's, idea. It's on my list. In the first, the first book, I think thinking in pictures, or maybe that's the second, but she gives this account that cows, cause they're prey animals uh -huh. don't like look straight on like a lion at their, mm -hmm. they, they're very much in their peripheral vision. Hmm. And she, uh, says, 
they'll be less afraid of something coming right at them than at, like a hat on a fence, right? Hmm. And like an anomalous thing over here. Hmm. And I was sort of, so I started to call those in my head, hat on fence issues, which are just things that bug people, uh, Yeah, you know? like yeah. avocados or you know or um someone in a mma with an mma tattoo or like just something that marks you as just like you're an enemy you know or mm -hmm. you're you know and i was thinking like we're feeling like all like prey animals like something is you know and it's not just the oppression olympics of you know well you're you grew up working class well i'll do you one better you know i grew up uh, homeless or whatever mm. um i it's um it's it's a, just an existential fear and you know things that we were supposed to all share blame for like the climate crisis well some people it turns out the left imagines are more to blame than others i.e obese people or people with big cars or people with you know diesel or truckers and just making it divisive like that is i mean making some making what has to be a collaborative project into an us and them project is not very adaptive right you know? right um so how do and, we stop doing that because that is an enormous problem like polarization is a you know we we see it in the um just affecting it in the work we do in advertising but like it affects everything and yeah um, and, and so do you see this as as one of the major threats that we face today well i think that the i think that the cultural analysis so yes cul like treating it as culture before it becomes politics so you know mm. an example is when i was out with some very lefty friends the other night they were talking about the ottawa truckers and yeah. they started and one of them said they're just miscreants with their you know and they were oh that they were peeing on the tomb of the unknown soldier someone said and i was thinking about how important it was to all the progressives around me at various times to safeguard the right of people to burn the American flag, right? Because the, these are speech acts, you know? And like, and peeing on a grave is, while not especially classy, is certainly, you know, certainly should be allowed in some generalized form of rowdy, but, you know, a rowdy protest. So it's not, it's been someone else said, well, it's not perfect civil disobedience. They're not like lying down and getting their ribs cracked, you know, when the mm -hmm. police um, are after them like Dr. King. But I sort of thought we have to cool off all that and say, you know, we can't look at them and just instantly say, we don't like their shirts. We don't like how loud they are. We don't like, you know, because we just sound like, you know, our parents or grandparents saying like, look at those rowdy hippies with their long hair and their, and braless stinky ways you know and then ask what their what their uh you know what their political needs are i don't care about the emotional i don't both sides on the emotional thing like oh these people feel hurt or economic and anxiety no and they seem plenty racist to me no question but they could, did have a pretty narrow cast thing they wanted which was like less quarantine when they came over unvaccinated from America, where you're not required to be vaccinated when you get here. And I think you and I can say that reasonable people can disagree about the length of the quarantine for someone coming back to their own country, since we have no such quarantine here in the United States. We're quite yeah. familiar with not having one. Sorry. <coughs> I'm getting worked up and getting COVID. <laughs> um, the, but the, um, you know, so it would have been cool if we could put aside for a second that, you know, everyone's mad at diesel truckers or anti-vaxxers and let, you know, elegant Trudeau make some gesture at saying this is still a democracy and you've brought up a point and the point, blessedly, is not some like supreme fascism like we want martial law or we're storming the Capitol but a question about vaccines that, as I say, I think reasonable people can disagree on. But the beginning of that solution is lifting off the cultural concerns, the hat on fence issues that drive us all crazy with each other. You know, I just saw, probably you did too, a video of a woman who just wants other people to not wear masks. Like, like she's just mad because people mm -hmm. wear masks. You know, it reminds mm -hmm. me of people being angry at women in hijab or, or, you know, kids in hoodies, like, 
why we don't owe it to anyone to hide our show our faces or hide them or whatever like we you know and and yet somehow this had made her mad and i just thought wow her whole day like even if what if she has like a robust conservative agenda she's accomplishing nothing just by hating people for wearing masks over their nose and mouth um and similarly i think you know just trying to see what a truck what a trucker protest is, what some of these symbols mean and taking and recognizing them as symbols, i.e. reading an event instead of feeling like we're perpetually at war. That is so beautiful and important. And uh, so so what, I, what I'm interpreting the kind of the what's critical about this is critical is that you're you're going to root causes you're going to issues before they become the political issue or at least going a yes. few levels up in the chain and going let's just explore that without projecting our biases into that and try to actually understand yes. what the core issues are so we can have a meaningful dialogue about that that seems really important it seems really yeah. important <laughs> yeah 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 it seems like you know get to culture when it's when it's open before it calcifies into a culture war yeah um and yeah well and i want i want to know if you buy this so, something that i've started to think about um because we're in media um that i think is unique about the the stage that that we're in um did you do you know meta world peace um, Ron Artest, no. and there was a there was a, a NBA player. We, we actually have a, a we, we've built a relationship with him. He was on the show a few months wow. ago, and um, but he was an NBA player. Um, he he was with the Lakers. He's with like six different teams, but he was with the Indiana Pacers. They went to Detroit to play the Detroit mm -hmm. Pistons. Uh, this was probably this might have been like 2007. Um, uh, somebody threw a uh, uh, soda at him as a player from mm. the stands while he was mm -hmm. taking a break to try to center himself because he was getting really overwhelmed. Um, he ran into the stands and started beating up the fans. Um, it was it was called Malice at the Palace. They did a Netflix special on it. It was really fascinating. Wow. And, and the work that he's done since that happened is extraordinary. He's like, I mean, he literally changed his name to Meta World Peace and has mm. been really trying to um, heal and help other people heal. And he's like built relationships with the guy that threw the, the stuff at him and just an incredible mm -hmm. story. Mm -hmm. But the point is what was the reason that was such a jarring experience, I think, is because you had somebody doing something which is on a stage and they actually came mm -hmm. and attacked the audience. And that was so shocking that the person who is there to, you know, to, that is part of that entertainment, even if they're the foil, even if they're coming into town and they're the bad guys and people are rooting mm -hmm. against them, you don't turn on the audience. And I feel like what has happened in media yeah. and in, in, yeah. in, in institutions which are losing our trust every single day is they've found contempt for their audience and they've turned on the audience and they now attack mm -hmm. them. It's one thing if you wanna attack Donald Trump, he's a big boy. But when you come mm -hmm. at everybody that he has adopted something that they connected with and turn them into villains, mm -hmm. it becomes a, it becomes, you can't do anything. Nobody can do business. And, yeah. and, and I feel like this is happening everywhere. And, and, and certainly I think the, the, the extreme conservative outlets are a lot more obvious uh, in their, in their flaws and their judgments and their, um, you know, in, in many cases, ignorance. Um, but, uh, but I think it's an equal pro in equal parts on, on both left and right. And so what mm -hmm. we're trying to do to be proactive in this, um, you know, we're not trying to like, we sit in between these advertisers and mm -hmm. thousands of voices in, in podcasts and, and some other channels. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And we're trying to match make all the time and get them to be brand ambassadors. But brands are now, you know, you've seen uh, stakeholder capitalism and the idea that brands should have more ownership of what they align themselves with in their supply mm -hmm. chains. And media is very much a part of that. So what we're trying to do is say, hey, listen, rather than try to, you know, come up with blacklists and go, these, these people are safe, these people are mm -hmm. not, these people say the right words, these people don't, or using Twitter mm -hmm. as, as judge and jury, we're trying to advocate for third party sources that don't have a political bent to come in and give us content labels on media the way that we mm. have in CPG, 
the way that, you know, if you go to the drugstore and buy anything, if you go to the grocery store and buy anything, they have to tell you things about the ingredients that you're about to put into yourself. Media True. has none of this. But if we could actually have a more con informed consumer and informed sponsor, you might see mm -hmm. people at least have the freedom to make better choices because, you know, Americans mm -hmm. don't like to be told what they can and can't do. Uh, and who they can yeah, and can't right. listen to and read. And you can try to sublimate, but like you can try to, you can try to hold them down. It's not, you're not going to hold them down. You're going to make them bigger and stronger. So, yeah, you know, you so know, what do you think of it? I Sorry, think... I just put a lot out there and now I'll shut up I and like... let you just <laughs> respond. I mean, I, 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 yeah, I, that seems right in principle to me. Uh, it's, I just, I think I would consider different labels. So, in some ways, um, I like all you know always to go in my head to well, what were what were some of the earlier times that things got labeled? So like yeah. before Tipper Gore and before the uh, rating system of movies, one of the ways that things got labeled is the Dewey Decimal System, right? Yeah. And the Dewey Decimal System that divides things by subject and on, in podcast things are divided by subject. We just take that for granted that yeah. they're going to be society and culture, which is where, you know, this is critical is Trump cast is under politics. But the other thing that podcasts don't do very well, and that I really would complain about is they don't label fiction as well as they should. Yeah. So I don't know if you've ever had this, but it looks something looks like a true crime show. And you have to scroll down the description to find out it's like, this person is played by Julia Roberts, you know? <laughs> and, 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 you know, I'm not a big listener to fiction podcasts. So I always feel a little frustrated, like, you know, something sounds uncanny candy about it when you start, like the yeah. call that comes to 911 sounds a little bit yeah. fake. And I love fiction in other ways. I don't love it in podcasts. Okay. Well, but by there, the way, by the way, you know, it, when you have a paid actor in your commercial doing a testimonial, you're supposed to disclose that, right? Yes. I, I totally think that we need to some standardization of standards, right? right. Because it's, it's so wild west, but it's also killing yes. us. And podcasts is an example. It's yeah. not, I mean, this is how media is fragmented everywhere, but totally with you on this, but please, okay. please continue. But one thing that, one thing that interested me at Trumpcast was yeah. how can we signal to listeners that this is not just news because, or, or not sort of bare bones news. It's far from a wire report. I mean, we had like, you know, crazy music, like everyone has music, like their variety shows, you know, even if you're doing, you know, day one, the New York Times show about the rise of neo-Nazis or Nazis in, in Germany. Um, it's like, there's music you're yeah. in this, you know, which you would never have in a wire report. Like you're not reading just the facts. And then you, you know, on Trumpcast, we had can't stump the Trump and like this goose steppy sound which is mm -hmm. obviously putting massive torque on anything that goes after it, you know? Mm -hmm. And um, and then beginning, you know, back with Serial, where sometimes in the spirit of going back to the, you know, original way of doing this, and since that marked such a separation in how we listen to podcasts, Sarah Koenig did just such a good job of dramatizing her own, you know, her own attractions and repulsions. Um, so that, you know, she, she, I remember her saying, you know, I'm really too excited about solving this. Like I'm close to solving it. Or, you know, she felt like a little attraction to Adnan Syed, her subject. And she made that very clear. To so the self-awareness and disclosure was built into the narrative in a very authentic way. And the idea that, you know, get in your fiction space right now, because you're in with an unreliable narrator. Every host is an unreliable narrator. There's no host on these host driven shows like Joe Rogan's or mine, who's totally reliable. How could yeah. we be? We're not yeah. galaxy, you know, brains. I write for newspapers all the time. When you write for a newspaper, there's 87 checks that you don't get things wrong. You know, listen to any unedited hosts, listen to this, you know, me right now. Mm. And we're just like stuttering and we get some of the facts wrong. We both stumbled over Sarah Koenig's name, for yeah. instance, yep. but you know, we don't want it to come across like we don't know that name. So we re retract it, right? That's what happens on podcasts, but lots of things go by unchecked. I've gone given wrong citations, terrible pronunciations. <clears throat> so every host should be taken as an unreliable narrator in the beginning and all that other apparatus, the music, some of the self-consciousness of the host, some of the 
oh, I don't know, by play with, with the guests, some of the backing and filling in a true crime show, like, oh, we got that wrong. Or we, you know, I just listened to a, another wonderful New York Times um, show called The Trojan Horse Affair, where I don't want to mm -hmm. give anything away, but at the very end, you know, they, well, at one point, they don't get what they were looking for. And you've seen that they've gone down a lot of bad roads, right? And so you want the listener to say, I'm not listening to an omniscient galaxy brain who knows every single thing, does everything right, never makes a grammatical mistake, never makes another mistake. I'm in a place where I'm like willing to trust that this is going mm -hmm. in some like decent directions. I'm in good hands, but I'm also with a human, you know, and yeah. you have that feeling that you have being with a human that they're not gods and they're they're flawed and i think the people who stick with joe rogan and by the way i am all for neil young in that the people who stick with him appreciate that he makes it clear that that show is speculation imagination course correction all the time i mean that's what people like about a howard stern or a drive time radio host that they are uh, they're self-aware and in many cases and they're not claiming to be the authority they're not claiming to be the authority. And I so, will say, I, I think Spotify should have dropped him for the disinformation, just the way um, Jack Dorsey ultimately dropped people for disinformation from Twitter. But, but <coughs> that said, I see why I think Joe Rogan has signaled to the listener, and I think we all need to signal to listeners and advertisers, um, whether we're doing a straight reported show where you can take everything we say to the bank or and whether it partakes of the apparatus of fiction. Well, so one of the things we've been advocating for is a line of distinction or disclosure between what is news and what is opinion. You know, mm -hmm. you used to have some pretty clear lane lines on that stuff, but, um, but that's not really done. And so if you go to Apple podcasts and you look for news, you're going to have people, you know, that are talking for an hour off the top of their head. Totally. You know? And, and that's classified as news. Um, do you, um, but is that actually um, a necessary step as well? Do you think that delineation? Um, there, I mean, this weird thing happened at the time, at the New York Times when I was there, which is, you know, anyone who went to journalism school 20, 30 years ago learned about the so-called triangle lead, right? The like, who, what, when, where, where, how at the very top and, and that all this information and then maybe down to like one quote from the police at the end. Yeah. Like it gets a little more specific and sparse. You never see stories like that anymore. Everyone yeah. knows the idea of a quote lead. They even teach it in schools. And those leads, those really colorful leads, you know, that are just like, um, you know, Dan picked up a brick outside his house. He looked at it. My father made this brick, he said. Dan's hair was, you know, disheveled from the sun and so on, right? Those color leads that used to be parts of magazines that, you know, played a little fast and loose. Like if they gave a perfect quote, like I just yeah. did, my father made this brick, you, you know, you would have had to fact check it, but also like, did you really say my father made this brick or did you say my father crafted this brick, right? Mm -hmm. It could have been that you got it wrong on the pad, whatever. So people start to accept more and more possibilities of fiction Fiction at the level of colorful language, not fiction at the mm. at the at the level of opinion torque, right? And then on the opinion pages, they're getting opinions. Then blogs appear, and every nobody has any money, so they just say their opinions. Nobody's going out and reporting. I mean, I don't think people understand how expensive reporting is versus how cheap uh, talk is, right? Yeah. And most radio stations, you know, oh, they're AM figuring that stations, out. <laughs> Oh, right, exactly. Well, I yeah. should say, yeah, producers and uh, and podcast companies know it very well. But you know, you listen to those Times shows. I mean, the one that I I was just talking about, the Trojan Horse Affair. You know, they're just like, well, we might want to talk to someone. So the three of us flew to Perth. You know, it's just like <laughs> they're right. We're like, and then they get like three sentences out of it. Well, that's what really expensive reporting used to be. And th when someone's flying to Perth and there's a Perth Dateline you know, what would have appeared in the newspaper as like Perth, Australia, and then the date, um, you know that you are in the presence of something that can be fact-checked, should be fact-checked, and is fact-checkable. But if you start out with like, you know, Howard Stern talking about his small penis or whatever, 
you yeah. should be in you should enter that space in your brain that's like oh we're now in like crazy land where everyone's exaggerating and that's part of the game and similarly opinion you know if i say like you know well, i don't know probably really early in this show i signaled what side i'm on politically i'm not yeah. just like not no hiding it right yeah. but that's not so much to signal whether you're telling the truth or lying because nobody wants to be thought to be lying it's just signaling what genre you're in and how to read what you're saying you okay know? so so let me let me let me pa pause you for one second i know we're we're almost out of time but but i want to um get the tactical recommendation out of you here if there is one so mm. is your is your thinking that it should be understood and we just people just need to use their judgment or do you believe that we need to have some some specific requirements of disclosure well so uh, so one of the interesting things about advertising is that it's always thriving on blurring the distinction so right so it's like every ad wants to look like in Victorian newspapers wants to look a little bit like a news story so you like accidentally take them in sure sure so and you know increasingly you know newspapers say eager for advertisers are willing to almost lend out their typeface and all these other things because they don't have advertisers so they want to make it look you know so they really are willing to let the, the ad be native yeah. same with me doing host reads right but host reads are a perfect example where on the one hand, you're supposed to kind of confuse them for a recommendation from your friends. Mm -hmm. On the other hand, podcast listeners have learned how to understand them. And and like I never have someone come up to after me. They've listened to the podcast so carefully, but they never say, like, do you really love me undies? I should try them. Mm -hmm. You know, it's just like I incidentally I do. But I also know that when I'm talking in that particular way, we all know how to understand it. But we, so we have some people trying to blur the difference where it's paramount that readers and listeners understand the difference. And I think it's paramount for production companies and hosts to take it upon themselves to teach readers, listeners what they're doing. So, you know, it's strictly speaking, everything should be divided into fiction, nonfiction. Clearly, that's the first thing. And then um, in nonfiction, I think features that have a lot of color news that have just straight reporting you know just like who what when where why yep. and then some and then some kind of opinion um you know in my so you would I like to see my, those labels actually applied through platforms i think that's, i would by the I way think that's right yeah i think that's right <laughs> yeah and i and maybe maybe there's a way to say features because people do get confused about what like there's some leftover relics from magazines or from news magazines on tv that younger people are unfamiliar with, you know, what are the hallmarks of a profile, right? Like yeah. a profile in, um, and, uh, and a feature I think is an especially difficult one because features look like fiction because they're like a lot of heavy storytelling, tons of detail, tons of character analysis. Yeah. And, um, and they, but they're not opinion, right? Right. But they're also not straight news. So I think that you, you know, divide it up like you divide a magazine and don't label things according to what, what their politics are, but the fact that they're expressing yeah. heavy opinion yeah. and you can, tr you don't have to like do some algorithmic analysis. Like if I say, you know, if I, like I use the hallmarks of, I think, I believe, I argue, you know, I say those things and those are the cues to whether, you know, I'm telling you the straight facts or I'm you know, I, I use the first person a lot. And so does Joe Rogan, right? Yeah. That's how you know. Um, and uh, yeah, personal essays is another kind of form, like, yeah. you know, the like this American life. Yeah. Um, so anyway, I think that there are some genre differences to be drawn, the close, you know, thin slicing it um, more than, you know, danger, danger, you might hear an opinion here, right? Yeah. No, I hear you. I hear you. And we're, um, we're working with some folks that are trying to do this um, in, in different ways. So like um, we're partnered with uh, Ad Fontes Media, which makes a media bias chart. You know, they're, they're using humans, um, but, but standardized metrics to try and evaluate reliability and bias in news. Mm. Um, we're also working with a group 
um, and going to be announcing um, more details very soon, um, who's actually using AI to um, evaluate risk levels based on the, the GARM, Global av Advertisers for Responsible Media, their brand safety mm -hmm. framework, where they've got 11 different criteria that might be violence, sexuality, you know, things that... Mm -hmm you know, parsing it out and going like, okay, if you're looking to consume or um, support this, this type of content, like know what you're getting into and make sure it aligns with mm -hmm. values that you're comfortable with as a brand. So the, like, that's, that's where we're headed. I don't know if it's a perfect way, but like, I don't feel like the way, way we're doing things is working very well. And it's mm -hmm. like, I think mm -hmm. everybody has this idea that one side's going to win and then things will be okay. And it's like, no, there's no winning in this. You know, we just have to I manage mean, when better. Right. One way I can um, speak as a host is that the way that, say, a Joe Rogan is doing a disservice, and I've probably, I believe, been guilty of this myself, is not ironizing at all what the person you're talking to is saying. And by ironizing, I mean introducing not doubt, but a um, just willingness to keep it in quotation marks, mm -hmm. you know? So sometimes he will, when he's talking to some of his disinformation peddlers, he'll say, um, well, this is just the science and the science, the science, we're talking about reality, you know, and that is unfair to the listener because mm -hmm. he hasn't, he doesn't know if that adds up with the science and he doesn't know if he's speaking reality, you know, and I've had guests on who do social science or science and I still need to frame things, not like, um, oh, you're lying or I'm calling you out. It's not like Jonathan Swan interviewing Trump and like tons of gotcha, but more like, you know, oh, I see how in your field, this would be a way of framing it to get these effects or whatever. Um, when I'm, you know, just to remind listeners that we are not, we don't have some privileged relationship with the truth on our show, yep. which is like what a lot of, uh, you know, what a lot of uh, opinion, you know, it's like, Anyway, you probably saw like years ago, Sean Hannity and Alex Jones were both in different lawsuits and they both were like, what? I'm a performance artist, mm. you know? Yeah. And like, you can't take anything I say seriously. And Tucker Carlson sometimes says the same. Well, you don't say that except once in your lifetime. And every other time you go back to saying like, I'm a serious newsman. Well, and I, I think that's a nice way to, to loop back around to what we were talking about uh, since the beginning of this, which is, you know, people are do have a hard time separating fact from fiction. And so, you know, to the extent that we can, you know, create something that that is that is evenly distributed across creators, but mm -hmm. does require some of that disclosure, I think we could be more informed on what we're getting ourselves into. I think, you know, the we we were trusted with a lot of freedom. I think that you know, these toys mm. may be more powerful than we're quite ready to play with yeah. at this stage. We may yeah. need more training first, right? I so. think that's right. I mean, I not to just drag this out too much, but yeah. you know, I hope I'll make one pitch to advertisers actually for why a this is critical talk show say is a great is a great thing to advertise. Yeah, against, let's do it. Right. Um, it's that state that I described, the willing suspension of disbelief, is exactly the state that you want someone in when they are looking at an advertisement or listening yeah. to a host read of an advertisement. You want them in the playful state, not the credulous, gullible, you know, I'm going to be hypnotized by your subliminal, horrible messages that make me spend more than I have on something I don't want. Right. No, you want them, you want, you know, it's like I wrote for and uh, the reason that features that front, the front page of the New York Times started to use those featurey color leads that, you know, I tried to do an impression of earlier um, is that advertisers like them more they're like richer they're more sensory emotional environment right so like you have stuff going on but that stuff doesn't have to be snuff and porn it just has to be like human trust building we're talking about normal human things we're not yeah. talking about like crazy QAnon things but advertisers are so afraid of being around quote disinformation that they don't like that that loose the, the, their, the desire for that looseness is cut against by the desire for just the facts, just the facts, just the facts. And a just the facts show reads like a wire report and is not what anyone wants either. Mm -hmm. So I think it has to be clear that these podcasts are at least two thirds entertainment, at least two thirds some form of art, 
at least two thirds about the voice, the music, the mix, the you know, and um, and so I'm not sure that completely wrenchingly separating out the like spinachy facts from the horrible delusions of the rest is the way to go as much as to train the listener into getting into that state of the willing suspension of disbelief, which does not mean that you're a gullible, you know, you don't jump off of buildings after the Marvel film you just saw. Because That's right. Were, yeah. Yeah. You thought you could fly. Exactly. Yep. 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 This is great, Virginia. This is you've been really generous with your time and um, and it's been a fun conversation. I hope we get to keep talking. Um, so um, do you do you, you mind? That. Yeah. Do you mind throwing out some plugs for how people can uh, get connected with you oh, and, yeah. and also uh, best way to to get to this is critical? Um, I am one of those loathed people that spends way too much time on Twitter. So that's the best way. Just one stop place to find me at page 88. Um, and the show is at this critical pod on Twitter. Um, so this is critical is the podcast wired is my main perch for all writing on tech and culture and some politics. Um, and then I just write for lots of other places, including, as you said, the Atlantic and the New York times and the LA times and Politico and, uh, playboy sometimes. Mm. Vogue. Um, I, um, yeah, I really, it's the whole range of tech culture and politics that um that all interest me i guess i don't write about finance or sports <laughs> me neither um okay well yeah. thank you <laughs> all right well we'll keep it going and uh and I, I i hope a lot of brands get a chance to uh to listen to this because i think you're uh, you're doing something that's really cool so thank you thank you so much all right Talk take care bye-bye this show is dedicated to our mission of mobilizing marketers to advance truth and civility in journalism we value clarity, truth, fairness, respect, de-escalation, and tolerance, and we invite you to connect with us at MediaRoundtable.com. If you found this show helpful and you're committed to our cause, please follow us on iTunes, Spotify, YouTube, or wherever you like to listen. It's always free, and if you're a marketer looking for support to live this out, you can get in touch with our agency, Oxford Road, by visiting OxfordRoad.com and subscribe to our weekly newsletter, The Influencer. Special thanks to Bianca, Kyle, Jennifer, Amy, and the team at Podcast One. And as always, influence responsibly. 